Good morning. Thank you for joining us. It's another episode of the program of the press where we take a look at the headlines to try and understand what is behind them. My name is Felicity Ezewike. You're welcome. Our guest today is public affairs analyst Bola Oba. Thank you very much for joining us. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to be on your set. Thank you. Thank you, too, for your time. Okay, we'll start this morning with a punch newspaper. Uh, the big one here is FG Ask Churches Mask Others to Submit Guidelines for Reopening. We also have Gulfs to Partner Presidential Task Force for Reopening of Economy. Nigerians purchasing chloroquine in large quantities, PTF cries out. Lagos releases coronavirus home treatment guideline next week. Uh, there are other stories here. Um, there is a, uh, a recap of some of the figures that we have in Nigeria now. We've, we're getting creeping close to 10,000. It's uh, 7,000 at the moment, um, just over 7,000. Uh, but we've had some good news with the recoveries. We've had about 1,900 uh, creeping to 2,000 people uh, released. Unfortunately, Nigeria has lost 211 people as of today. You can go get details of the breakdown uh, state by state. Also on the front page. Um, and there are other headlines here. Inflation hit two-year high at 12.34% in April. That's... Um, uh, MBS speaking, uh, details on page uh, 19 of the paper. Nigerians evading tax on foreign properties risk prosecution. I'll take that again. Nigerians evading tax on foreign properties risk prosecution. Um, Malami's on there. 10 trillion naira spent on fuel subsidy in 15 years. That's according to oil marketers. Observe Salah prayers at home, Sultan tells Muslims again. And then there is that um, unsightly picture of an accident. A woman dies, child, two others injured in Lagos. We had the FRSC uh, sector commander speak to us a little earlier uh, about that development. Um, there are other headlines, uh, but before we go to them, let me talk to you, Bola, on the federal government asking churches and mosques to submit um, their guidelines for reopening. Um, should that be the way it should be? Shouldn't it be the government giving them a guideline on um, how to go about ensuring that social distancing and all of the things are maintained? The government has already given a guideline. We have the government's protocol on how uh, sessions with more than one human being has to hold. Now that the government wants to gradually ease to the level of allowing congregations to hold, it is also incumbent on the churches and the mosques to detail out their own protocol, their own guidelines on how they intend to conduct their services so that experts can look over what they give and give counsel if there need be to make sure that lives of people are, are protected. That is what I want to believe. Uh, what about the yes. um, um, buying of chloroquine? The PTF is raising the alarm that people are doing that. Um, do, do you um, associate this with um, President Trump? That's the US president um, taking it, as he says, uh, for preventive uh, purposes. One, the blatant stupidity of a character you mentioned the name, I don't want to go into that. And the fact that uh, a governor who was once COVID-19 positive in Nigeria was also vehement when it, came, when it became negative, that that was one of the things he used. And you must also remember that a former presidential spokesperson Indeed, a medical doctor by training, but who I doubt whether he has ever practiced medicine in the last 30, 35 years, also was COVID-19 positive 
His wife was also COVID-19 positive. And according to him, the homemade self-treatment regime that he adopted, he also mentioned uh, hydroxychloroquine. So I am sitting there not quite surprised that some people may want to go quickly scamper to get it in case they develop. But the medical, the medical evidence out there is that it is very dangerous. Indeed, it is on record that it killed some people with other underlining, underlining conditions who got COVID-19 and they used it on them, especially elderly people, veterans in America. It is very, very dangerous to self-medicate in the first place. It is utterly dangerous that a, a medicament that has been researched to be inimical to the condition that people want to use it for is now being garnered by people who ignorantly believe the pronouncements and the utterances of some, of some uncultivated and uncultured, seemingly careless persons around the world. All right, let's look at this headline. Um, it was a big deal yesterday, the court ruling um, on Ese Oruru, the teenage girl in 2016 was alleged to have been uh, abducted and married off and had a child. Uh, the court has now sentenced uh, the hero to 26 years, and we know that uh, that's actually seven years. He'll be spending seven years in prison, uh, not the 26 years. What's your reaction to the ruling generally? He has spent about five years in detention before his conviction, and I guess that would also count as part of his tariff. We must be very... And as at this juncture, he is a convict. It was a very disturbing case when it came to the public. Very disturbing because one would have thought that the life of a young girl in a state in Yenogua Bayasa ought to be ought to be safe. And when the circumstance through which she is, uh, through which he exploited the girl, he loped with her or ran away or kidnapped her. The word elope would not be adequate would not be sufficient or be right because to elope the two parties would have had to have agreed. He deceived her, kidnapped her, and eventually the long end of the law caught up with him. The only saddening thing for me in the whole story is that it took five years, which speaks to some major hiccups in our criminal prosecution system. It took five years. Even after the celebrated Kaja, you know, uh, even after the celebrated Administration of Criminal Justice Act, Administration of Criminal Justice Act 1915, five years to prosecute a case of kidnap and sexual abuse. My sister, that speaks a lot negatively about our criminal justice system. Yeah, we, we do know that uh, we, have, we still have um, loads of issues to address when it comes to our judiciary, but some would argue that um, justice is justice. No. It, it, it's a little delayed, but it came around. Hello, my sister. I'm not saying the judiciary. The judiciary is just one arm of the criminal, criminal justice value chain. The criminal justice system starts with the policing authority, which is the investigating authority. The criminal justice system moves to the prosecutorial authority, which is not part of the judiciary. 
the, the, the criminal justice system also moves to the level of the substantive judiciary, the bench, you know, the bench. So I'm sitting there now thinking that uh, the criminal justice value chain, and you could you could investigate this case and ultimately find out that maybe some days when the guy was in detention, there were no vehicles to take him from the correctional center to to court. That is also part of the criminal justice system. All so right. when I holistically used criminal the, justice, the, you, the, you meant the, the wider, the wider system, justice I'm system. I'm not only referring to the bench. Okay, uh, let's go to this day newspaper now and see uh, what the big one is. Um, Nigeria loses 125 billion naira oil revenue to COVID-19 as prices slump in first quarter. Uh, a couple of riders to that story, uh, but you're not looking at it. You're looking at FG kicks against large gathering uh, during salad celebration. Cautions govs on lockdown relaxation. 339 new cases spike tally to 7,016 7, um, with 1,907 discharged. Those are some of the um, um, riders to that uh, big one. Um, let's see what's underneath the Nigeria losing 125 billion naira oil revenue. We have a federal government projects GDP uh, to contrast by contract rather by eight minus 8.9 percent. Uh, we also have suspend debt deductions from states. Inflation hits two-year high at 12.34 percent, and the World Bank pledges 1.5 billion. Um, um, dollars relief package to states. Uh, those are some of the uh, riders to that big one uh, for you this morning. Uh, there is also uh, economy on the mind, uh, but um, social distancing and the use of masks are well in view from the Minister of Finance and the Vice President Yemi Oshibanjo on the front page. Uh, Buhari amends executive order on offshore assets declaration. Um, Nigeria losing 125 billion Naira oil revenue to COVID-19. Um, what comes to your mind when you see uh, this headline? It's inevitable. It's inevitable because, as we've seen across the world, when you literally, literally stop economic activities, when the machine of commerce was literally altered. It's inevitable that the GDP will contract. It's inevitable that uh, there will be pronounced and profound losses. So those are, those are inevitabilities that are, that are manifesting as any uh, thinking person ought to have perceived them. All right, um, let's, see, let's see if we can take a look at um, uh, another headline before we move on to the next paper. There's something I skipped, I think. Uh, it has to do with INEC, how we will conduct elections during a uh, pandemic. Um, do you think we should be having this election? And what are the likely challenges that will come off it, considering our new normal? The elections are constitutional dictates. The gubernatorial elections are dictated by the Constitution. And when something is dictated by the Constitution, it is an inevitability, except there is a major provision of amendment targeted at that. That's number one. Number two is that in the midst of COVID-19, a liberal democracy like South Korea putting in place the right protocols conducted its parliamentary elections. Parliamentary elections were conducted in South Korea about three weeks ago. I'm sorry, about 
five, six weeks ago, and two weeks after the conduct of the elections, there was no spike in the South Korean, in the South Korean COVID-19 scorecard. Unfortunately, about two and a half weeks after that, at a discotheque, another spike was triggered. So I'm sitting there now telling you that if the right protocols were to be adopted, if the right things were to be done, if people take responsibility, if the elections management authority or board, INEC, does the right thing, there's nothing that says the gubernatorial elections in, in Edo and Ondo should not hold. All because right. in the first place, there are constitutional imperatives. All right, let, let's move on to the nation newspaper quickly in the time left. Uh, the big one here is federal government overrules governors and worship centers opening. Um, it has um, one rider. PTF wants as Nigerians buy up chloroquine uh, drug. That's, um, we talked about the chloroquine issue a moment ago. Um, just above that, inside the paper, you see inflation hits 12.34%. Lagos cuts 2020 budget by 21%. Um, isn't that a huge cut by any standard? Isn't what is, isn't what is, the Lagos state government what, has cut um, the 2020 budget uh, by 21%. I'm asking. Is you. inevitable. Is inevitable because the federal government has viewed its budget downwards. As we speak now, the two chambers of the National Assembly are, are looking over the downward review of the budget by the executive. Many states, many states governments have, uh, have, uh, have uh, reviewed their budgets downwards. Lagos State, too, apart from the fact that it's the state with the highest internally generated revenue, in Nigeria, a sizable percentage of his budget is still dependent on, uh, on monies gotten from federal allocations. And inevitably, in the backdrop of what we saw as the price of food in, in the first quarter of this year, it is just reasonable and, and sensible that Lagos State 2 reviews its budget downward. I'm also particularly interested in the fact that you read that the federal government plays state governors. governors are on are worship centers moving. opening. Hello? Yeah, no, I was just trying to help you complete it, that the federal government overrules governors on worship centers opening. Isn't that what you meant? Yes. Okay. We must state at this juncture that the federal government, especially the president, has an overriding power in how an infection is managed in this polity. Because the Quarantine Act enables the president to lock down any or put in place any measure that will protect the, the biosecurity or the health security of the citizens of Nigeria in any part of the country. So, in so much as some governors may want to assert the federal powers, the powers inherent in any federating, federating state or federating unit we must come to the realization that the federal government or the office of the president is a predominant player in how a quarantine or an infectious disease is managed. That's number one. Number two, some of these states are Muslim states wanting to pander to an ignorant populace. We must say at this juncture, that the Saudi authorities, who are the 
custodians of the only places of Mecca and Medina have canceled public congregational gatherings and prayers. We must also emphasize the fact that the Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, the Nigerian Supreme Council of Islamic Affairs under the leadership of His Eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, has ruled that for these Salah prayers, people should pray alone in their own houses. The tendency of some governors, and let's be specific here, the governors of Kano and Bauchi, Kano pandering, Kano pandering to a largely ignorant, uh, ignorant majority, which ultimately has culminated into the enormous amounts of lives lost in Kano, and the Bauchi governor, because he's a first-time governor and may, may be pandering to his electorate, ignorance electorate, because he would want to be in a better position to be re-elected, I think the right thing to do by the federal government is to overrule those governors and refuse them the libertine privilege of allowing people to gather together in this circumstance so that people, so that lives are not lost. All right, uh, Bola, thank you very much uh, for sharing your thoughts on the headlines this morning and giving us a better perspective on uh, some of them. It's a pleasure to have you always. Always a privilege to be on your side. Thank Take you. Take care and be safe. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the program Off the Press. It returns on Monday at 8.30 p.m. AM, I beg your pardon. Uh, do make it a date and uh, catch up on all the latest headlines. My name is Felicity Ezewike, wishing you a lovely day.